What's up, 49er fans? I'm Jason Aponte. The 49ers have a new defensive coordinator. Brandon Staley is the assistant head coach. I'm here for the overreactions, but I'm also here to try to explain. Make sure you like that video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell for when we go live. Let's do it. Welcome, everybody. Let's go, Niners. My name is Jason Aponte. Jason Aponte. Well, the search is over. And, you know, for me, this this move with Nick Sorensen wasn't a surprise based on everything that I heard at the Combine and I was told. Um, and kind of a little bit when we were talking about the cornerback interviews and who the 49ers have actually met with, it felt like when you look at the candidates and their backgrounds, so many of them were defensive coordinators. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, secondary guys. So secondary, meeting with a bunch of cornerbacks, first-round pick, kind of to me implies that the 49ers are about to take a different approach in terms of how they're building out their defense. Generally, and I think we all know this, it would be defensive line right off the bat. You know, you go defensive line and you, you know, pass rush, save secondary. But it feels like the 49ers have kind of tried that many times, and now – possibly could be moving to something different. That's a, at least the read I got on the candidates and their background and then who they met with at corner as well too. Um as far as Brandon Staley, I kind of I kind of want to elaborate on this a little bit more because I feel like a lot of people are are really really not feeling this move. And I want to remind people that Anthony Lynn was the assistant head coach and nobody batted an eye. And he wasn't exactly successful as the Chargers head coach as well, too. But I think what this move is, is this. Is Nick Sorensen's going to call the plays, but Brandon Staley is going to be the one that's helping game plan. And say whatever you want about Brandon Staley, the head coach. Brandon Staley's very good at game planning. Now, as a head coach, you don't have as much input in terms of the game plans because you have to put everything together all of it, right? You might be there for a little bit, but you wouldn't have the the loudest voice in terms of game planning on defense. I think that's what you're going to kind of see with Brandon Staley now that he can focus on just game planning. I like this move. Let me just be the first to say it. I like this move. I'm not I'm not using Brandon Staley's time as a head coach to get down on a move that puts him in a spot where he can just do what he's good at. Right. A lot of people are good at just offense. A lot of people are good at defense. There's a lot of people that are good at both and they can delegate and they can be a head coach. Brandon Staley probably falls in a place where I don't know uh, if he can be a head coach, but I do know that he can game plan very well as a defensive coordinator. I mean, even though he's not the defensive coordinator as a guy overseeing everything. And if he was able to just focus in on defense, I think we'd have a particularly different outlook with him. So it, it's it's twofold. I think the idea that John Lynch continued to say, we don't have to overhaul our thinking, and it felt like that meant something that was inside the building, and obviously it was. But you do need someone who can kind of oversee all of those things and help game plan. And it does feel like the 49ers are trying to evolve their defensive game plan a little bit. 60%, uh, they ran zone coverages, I believe, 60% of the time, which is one of the highest in the league. And that's what it's been under under Sala, under D'Amico, under Wilkes. Um, I don't think that that necessarily changes. But what Brandon Staley is, is very successful at and what the 49ers have been doing is two high looks, two safeties, split safeties. And it's from the Fangio tree, all of those things. I, I'm not nearly as worried about the, the Brandon Staley thing. I think. I think it'll be good for Brandon Staley to focus in on game planning for the defense. Sorensen gets his foot in the door as a play caller, and it goes hand in hand. One hand washes the other, both wash the face. So um, let's take some uh, comments real quick. Big City Man says, I've been saying that Shanahan needs his bags so Kyle can focus on offense. Is this it? I think it's unfair to say that uh, he needs his bags because bags is somebody completely different. Like he's just, he's different, right? Like he's in his own category. Um, but yeah, I do think that a lot of this year 
And the reason that, you know, Wilkes was, you know, quote unquote, not a good fit, whatever it is that everybody wants to say, is because Kyle had to kind of focus in a little bit more on that, um, probably than he wants to. And I don't think, I, I don't think, and I could be completely wrong, I don't think that he had to do that with D'Amico and Salah. I'm sure he had some input, but it felt like this year he was very hands-on. And I think Steve Wilkes even talked about it. Like, I'm learning defense from, I'm learning offense from him to better the defense. And you kind of see Kyle taking control in certain spots, calling timeouts when there's something that's on the field that he doesn't like um, with a certain look. Um, but I think it would be best if Kyle could just focus on offense or or other things. If he could find somebody who would do that, I just have a hard time saying that it's Spags because Spags is different, man. I mean, that guy is, you know, Super Bowl winner in different places. And I kind of wanted to address a little bit about the the Dave Maris stuff. Um, so I spoke to a Giants reporter who had, you know, extensive time with him. And Dave Merritt follows, you know, Steve Spagnola from the Giants to the Chiefs. And he said that he felt he felt that Dave Merritt should be deserving of a job. But when he was with the Giants, he wasn't looking for a job because he was raising a family in the Jersey area, right? In the Jersey area, didn't want to move, right? His kids get a little bit older than he follows Spags. Merritt's going to eventually get signed, but it, it felt like a little bit more like, you know how people say, well, why hasn't anyone hired him? Some pe Sometimes people don't want to be hired. I, I want to be here with my family. I, I built a, I built a, you know, a, a place here. I don't want to move my kids. That type of thing is happening. So it, it's kind of interesting to hear that little insight and that little nugget because I had no idea about that as well, too, even living in this area. But, um, you know, it's everything's copycat, right? So that's why the 49ers have, are losing coaches. Everybody's going somewhere else. Um, I think right now a lot of people are looking at Spags as like the blueprint um, in terms of being able to do that because of like the offense he's, he's, he's slowed down. I mean, 17-0 Patriots, Lamar Jackson this season, 49ers, you know. Um, but it's hard to say you found your spags when there's only he's a one of one, in my opinion, a one of one. Uh, Mark says, sub Jason, am I wrong for thinking he should have been the D.C. last year? Assuming last season went the same with him as D.C. instead of Wilkes, he'd look he'd be looked at as a young head coach candidate in 2025. I think that's fair. Um, but. I think, again, when you look at where this team was when now um, and again, like that whole thing that I said earlier about this being the secondary being the priority and having a secondary coach, because remember Sorensen played 10, 10 years in the league at safety. Um, I, I think that's what they were thinking with Wilkes, who's a secondary guy. What we lost sight of was the fact that Steve Wilkes has only called plays once as a defensive play caller. And that was in Cleveland. Um, never been a DC. I think that was something that we kind of overlooked. And we assumed that somebody who has such a long track record and resume would just hit the ground running. You know, you look up front, you're like, oh, those guys are going to they're going to eat up front and they're going to save. It It wasn't the fit that they believed it would be. And anybody who watched the 49ers saw that they were they were not in sync. I mean, for a few weeks, it looked like it was in sync. But I'm talking about like what Kyle envisioned for this defense, what it what it looks like, the play calls, all those things. It just it just felt like it was never really a fit, you know, and I think I think with Sorensen is it could have been him or Bullock's. But I think what ultimately gave him the edge is the fact that he has secondary experience. And I think the 49ers are about to invest either in the draft or find someone in free agency. And I think that they believe that the secondary is going to take a step with Sorensen there. I'm um, going to be very interesting to see how this draft process goes through. And for everybody who's like, well, we need this, we need that. Let's go through free agency first, because free agency, you can shore up some of your positions and then it can change your draft strategy. So when you see 49ers, you know, when you see the 49ers meeting with all position groups, it's not because they're prioritizing one or the other. It's because you have to do your due diligence on all these guys because once free agency is done and you've gone through and you've added someone who could possibly be a starter on the offensive line or, or at different positions, you've already gone through the process and, and you know met everybody, so you know what type of player to target. So I think, again, like the whole, well, why are they talking to the defensive line? Defensive line could be one of the priorities if they show up the offensive line in free agency, right? And and I think that's the part where you have to remain flexible. You have to look at all the outcomes. And that's why mock drafts are kind of funny right now. Like, it's very funny for mock drafts to come out and say, well, they need this, this, and this. But what if they address this need in free agency? 
or they get somebody else to, to fill that position. I think that's the part that uh, mock drafts kind of are silly right now um, because we have so much time in between um, the draft um, and the free agency. So we'll find out. We're going to find out pretty soon when it comes to that. Um, Vishal says, I love this hire. Sorensen seems like a D'Amico kind of hire. He can bounce ideas off of Staley, who provides a sort of veteran present kind of situation. Yeah, again, Vishal, I don't know if you heard earlier. I believe that this is going to be Sorensen calling the plays, but Staley being uh, part of the game plan. And I think, again, everyone remembers what Staley was as a head coach, as a defensive game planner, and focusing solely on that. I think he's a lot better than people think or remember. I, I have a hard time pointing to 2020 as a season of reference because of how weird COVID was and, and all the, and all the, you know, no preseason, all those things. But the Rams did give up the least amount of points in the NFL and the least amount of yards. And they did that with the two safety looks, keeping everything in front of them. I think Staley is here to oversee the operation, but not be the play caller. And what's wrong with that? I mean, again, Anthony Lynn was the assistant head coach and he helped with the run game and nobody really cared, you know? So I think for me, it's, it's, it's more about the name than it is the position because everyone remembers, oh my God, Brandon Staley was a disaster and they, they gave up, they gave up, oh my God, 70, you know, 70 points to the Raiders. It's less about being a head coach. And I think if he focuses in on this and he helps Sorensen, this is a pretty solid pairing right here. I actually, I, I'm not worried at all, actually, when it comes to that. Obviously, we'll see how it plays out. But this doesn't feel weird, right? Like, I think what would have been weird if it would have been someone who was completely not in the building or or a name that was completely off the board. Um, I think that would be more strange. This feels like continuity. And then it's being paired with someone who can help him game plan while he gets his feet wet. And uh, I I feel a little bit better about it. I think the secondary definitely is going to take a step 100%. Um, great Fox. Thank you for the donation, buddy. Hi, Jason. I don't really know what to think of this. Feels like Shanahan had a guy before he fired Wilkes. Then that didn't happen. And now he had to interview people and we ended up with this. The hard part is great Fox. And thank you again for the donation. When the 49ers are playing all the way through February, they're not thinking about the next defensive coordinator, right? Um, because you're playing that long. And then by that time in the Super Bowl, all the defensive coordinators that were viable have either moved on, gotten jobs, those type of things. So the 49ers always had to kind of look inside because the external candidates weren't many. And the 49ers were the only ones with a defensive coordinator opening. So that's why when John Lynch says, I had, you know, no rush, you know, we're we're fine. We know what we want to do schematically. We're not changing anything. It kind of just points over and over to an in-house hiring. And again, Sorensen played 10 years in the league. He was over in Seattle. Um, you know, he understands, he, you know, defensive pass game coordinator. I think, again, the idea of bringing him in and when you look at all the other candidates, Merritt, Bullocks, um, all these guys are secondary guys. I feel like the 49ers are ready to make a turn from defensive line and investing in them and investing in the secondary. Because I think we I think they believe we have a great defense, but. We're missing something else. And it's time to kind of change away from what we've been doing because receivers are better. Um, the, the game is, is geared towards, you know, passing and, and quarterbacks and you, you can't touch receivers. You need those lockdown corner guys. And I think, again, you you kind of are looking at the 49ers possibly looking at a, a different way of attacking the, the defense and how they stack it. So it. For me, this kind of feels like I think they were always going to go internal just based on the candidates um, and based on the continuity they wanted to show. But hiring a guy like this who has secondary experience, I think it feels like to me that they're going to transition to the secondary, almost like when D'Amico took over and the linebackers all started hooping. Um, Aziz, Greenlaw, Warner, obviously they were already good. But don't, don't, you know, don't discount the fact that a player can get that out of you, especially if he's played 10 years in the league, regardless of where you view him, whether he was an all pro 10 years in the league means something. So I do think that they are going to start prioritizing the, se the secondary a little bit more. And uh, I don't necessarily disagree. I think pass rush helps secondary, but secondary can absolutely help pass rush, especially with the 49ers having six um, free agents on the defensive line. And they're going to probably have to invest again in the defensive line in the draft, but maybe not in the first round, you know, at 31, you're either looking at an offensive line 
possibly cornerback, right? You know, you get Kool-Aid to slip a little bit. Um, I just saw DJ's latest mock. I believe they got him at 22. Um, that's a spot where if the 49ers identify a cornerback from 31 to 22, you can make a move. You can make a move. The 49ers don't need all 11. They probably need like five or six to hit, but you don't need all 11. So this is kind of just the way my mind is working around this, um, this, this higher. And I think what the 49ers are trying to do, but I hope that answered your question. I think I just said a bunch of stuff. Great Fox, but always appreciate you popping in, man. Um, I hope everything's good with you. Lester, Kyle knows when to upgrade C. Koseric Zagonia. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, I mean, look, Brandon Staley, the head coach, Brandon Staley, the defensive coordinator, two different things. Even though Staley's not the defensive coordinator, I think he has a great mind for game planning. It's going to allow Sorensen to get into the, the play calling part of it. It'll be in unison. I suspect that that's what this is. It's one was going to come with the other. So you have someone who's internal who is – going to you know promote continuity and you have someone to oversee it since the 49ers run a lot of split safety and that's staley's uh you know specialty and the fact that possibly staley could be trying to evolve this defense to to just attack these offenses that are are getting better and better as the as the years go on and and all the little wrinkles that are there so i i'm fine with this like honestly i'm not i'm not worried obviously it's too early to worry it's march 2nd but you have to look at the candidates what what's the best possible outcome? I feel like this is this is probably it. And and I think um the Brandon Staley black smudge on his record is as a head coach. It's not as a defensive player. I mean a defensive coach. So um we just have to remember that part of it. Um it's just the recency bias creeps in and you're just like, oh he got fired. It's like well Anthony Lynn was here as the assistant head coach from the Chargers as well too. He's a run game guy. Well they're bringing in the fired coach from the Chargers to actually be a defensive guy. So I think one one thing is kind of like the other, but this has to be viewed as a Sorensen and Staley thing now. And I think to the point that we saw earlier, it'd be really good for Kyle Shanahan to just stick to offense, not have to worry about it, not call timeouts when he sees the cover zero blitz, all that stuff. So um, and Vishal says, I heard Staley is good at drafting defensive guys. Yeah, you know, another thing that I wanted to point out with Staley was you know, the first year that he was there, their defense was at the bottom of the league in almost everything, right? And that's scary, right? And it, it doesn't make sense because you're a defensive coach. You you would expect one thing to be ahead of the other, regardless, right? Like as a head coach, you have a lot to do. You have to figure out, you know, uh, you know what you're going to be doing, time management, all that stuff. But those guys were hurt all the time. Joy Bosa's is hurt all the time. They signed J.C. Jackson. J.C. Jackson doesn't end up being the guy that they want him to be. Derwin James gets hurt. That defense is always constantly banged up. Now, does that mean that that's the excuse for the way that that defense is performed? No, but that context is needed uh, when it comes to all those things. And again, Staley is calling for downs and he's like, you know, go for it, this and that. Like he cannot solely focus in on game planning, you know, on the defensive side. So I think a lot of that is forgotten when Staley gets the book thrown at him for how the the Chargers flamed out last season, you know? And then it's hard to win games when Justin Herbert's injured and, and you know, on offense and, and you know, Eckler's injured and, you know, those, those guys that they, you know, they drafted Quinn Johnson didn't exactly pan out. Um, It's it's not as dire as, as a lot of people would lead you to believe. I am, I'm actually of a mind that I think this works as a tandem with Sorensen and Staley. And I think Staley kind of gets a bad rap because of a head coaching job but you forget that he's a very good defensive mind. And he's from the Fangio tree as well, too. So I think there's a little bit of progression in terms of how he can evolve this defense and give different looks and 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 actually combat personnel, not just be pigeonholed into, like, the 60% zone coverages that the 49ers have run under all the other DCs, but matching personnel with something that works because you've seen things on tape. I think that that's what Brandon Staley is here to do. And I'm actually feeling a lot better about it, you know, as we we talk through it, you know, and the same thing with Sorensen again, safety in this league. He's been, he's played 10 years. You can't discount that. When D'Amico Ryan's took over, the linebackers took a leap. I do think the secondary takes a leap. And I do think the 49ers are, are about to prioritize the secondary either in the draft or free agency. We, they, I believe that they think that that's the missing piece. They can find pass rusher after pass rusher. 
Um, remember, every free agent pass rusher that's out there will let Chris Kusser get his hands on him. I think that's still true today. But I think just investing in that solely and not the back end is where the 49ers feel like they're just – that's that little boost besides offensive line, clearly, guys. But that's that little boost, especially on the defensive side, that they need that are, that can get them over the hump, right? Um, and I think that's fair. I think when you look around, I think obviously we don't know what's going to happen with Dre Greenlaw. There's been speculation that Aziz Al-Shair, uh, you know, should come back. I think he should, but I, I think he's going to get it back. I think a lot of people forget he set a Titans franchise record for tackles last season. It's not going to go unnoticed. Um, but I do think, again, if you had to ask any 49er fan or any analyst, where are you most concerned with this defense? Even if the pass rush wasn't what we thought it would be, it's it's the secondary. I, I think everybody would just say it's the secondary immediately. So shout out to you guys. 20 minutes in, uh, 50 people in here. I know you guys are either watching the combine, watching something else. Make sure you guys like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell when we go live. I'm back from the combine on no sleep. Um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to talk anything that you guys want in terms of combine once, you know, we get through this, this DC thing. You know, anything that you guys uh, want to talk about, things that I heard, funny stories, whatever. A lot of stuff happened this entire week. I, I'm i running on no sleep right now. But JR says, seems like a smart move. Pretty excited. Do you think the Niners should focus on offensive line, offensive tackle or a number three corner free agency? Much love, bro. You know, I, I appreciate you, man. I think the the hard part to say about like, oh, well, we'll just go sign an offensive lineman is that the, the offensive linemen that are generally good, they're not out there to be bought. You know, it, it, it's such a commodity that people just don't let them walk at all. Um, and that's why people are willing to overpay. See McGlinchey, comma, Mike. You're willing to overpay for guys that, you know, you you know are have played in the league because it's so hard to find. I think this year is a little bit different because on when who is out there from the Patriots. And I think that's a splash move because he's 26. You sign him and now. Your interior O-line looks completely different. Like, you just don't have a starter. Like, you've got a very good starter. And then you can remain flexible in the draft. You can do whatever you want. You want to trade up? You want to go get a wide receiver? I've been seeing Troy Franklin um, get mocked to the 49ers a lot. You want to trade up? You want to get Brian Thomas? You know, you want to add to this, this, you know, I think the thing that we saw in the Super Bowl was press man is really hard uh, for the 49ers to beat outside of Brandon Ayuk. So you might need another separator. That might be just what, like, you have to keep the options open. That's what free agency is for. So when you see mocks on March 2nd, March 3rd, and people are like, oh, this, this, and this, we don't know what they're going to do in free agency. They can address one of these needs with anything. But I think when you look around, there's a number three corner that they can get for, for pretty cheap in free agency and sign um, the guy from the Patriots. And it's just like you can give yourself ultimate flexibility if you find yourself in a spot with – you know, a starting lineman and a number three, you know, and and I think that's the that's the part that is exciting. Still, the 49ers don't need all 11 draft picks. A trade up is absolutely in the cards. You know, could they could they make a move for for Kool-Aid who might slide down boards now that his foot is broken? Um, I think that's absolutely fair. Um, if you have concerns about his character, that's one thing. That's fine. I don't think anybody can doubt the talent. But remaining flexible based on what you do in free agency in the draft allows you any endless possibilities trade up you know wide receiver corner o-line whatever you want for a pass rusher like if chop chop robinson's there um i don't know how you pass on somebody with those elite traits like that so again it's it's important to remember that right now while the 49ers have clear needs that can be addressed in the draft they can absolutely be addressed in free agency and I think that's the part that a lot of people are forgetting when they're seeing all these mocks and they're looking at like, well, why is defensive line going here? Well, if they get a, get themselves a nice offensive lineman, you know, who's out there, actually, things could change pretty quickly. So, all right, let's see. Chris Royal, thank you, man. Appreciate your content, my guy. I love the real takes on how you balance your fandom versus your analysis. You're a boss, bro. Keep grinding. Appreciate you, Chris. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really easy to not like get carried away with fandom right now on March second. Like I think it's 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 super easy during the season. It's completely different, right? When we we're going through these games and you see all the talk about, well, I don't know if the Niners are for real right now. All this stuff is just projecting, projecting pretty much all the. <laughs> it's projecting all of these prospects, figuring out what the 49ers thought process is, and then now you know they they finally notched the the final the final thing they needed to do, which was get a defensive coordinator. Um and 
Brandon Staley uh, is your assistant head coach. So, I mean, I again, to kind of recap, if you just got here, I'm fine with this. It's twofold. Sorensen calls the plays. Staley does the game planning. I'm fine. I'm fine. I think a lot of people forget that Staley's very good at game planning. Probably the only thing he's really good at. You know, um, the Chiefs thing is a little bit of a, a difference. Uh, I mean, the Chiefs thing, the head coach thing is a little bit of a difference. But I think you're forgetting, like, the game planning part of it. Um, so, all right, let's talk about it. Vishal says, I believe one of the three, McCaffrey, Gore, Rice is going to be drafted to the 49ers. I'm thinking McCaffrey or Rice. All right. Um, I'm going to going to say something. Something I believe, something I've researched. I am not as big on Brendan Rice as everybody else is. Now, hear me out. I think McCaffrey is a better receiver than him. I think Frank Gore is going to go in the fifth, sixth round, maybe undrafted. But the Brendan Rice thing, that's your that's just your name. Um, when I watch him, I see an incredibly stiff route runner. And I see a guy that just relies on being able to bully people with his upper body. To, he can't gain separation on his own as a route runner. For that, just keep Juwan Jennings. I mean, he's a better blocker. I I don't see the Brendan Rice thing. I just don't, man. Outside of the name. Put me down is out on Brendan Rice. I'm good. Like, I'm good. I don't need him. I don't need him. McCaffrey's better, I believe. 100%. Gore is going to go so late or undrafted that the 49ers will have a chance to scoop him. But, yeah, the Brendan Rice thing, I just don't get it. And I haven't been able to talk about it on camera. You know, like, this is the first time I'm really, like, vocalizing these things. But I watched him at the Senior Bowl run a, uh, run a whip route on the goal line, and he was, like, looking like he was running on cement, like, running, with, like, in cement. Very stiff, not fluid. Um. You know, just relied in college on just being bigger. Can't gain separation with routes. Um, I'm out. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, there are other receivers I would take a shot on. Um, if Jacob Cowing is there, I would take him in a heartbeat over Brendan Rice. Um, Brendan Rice is probably going to go in the third round. Um, so I think I think someone is going to take a chance, right? And you look at some of the highlights at, at USC. Um, he made some plays. He was open. I just I don't see it translating to the the next level. Um, I just I watch a guy who is stiff, who isn't who isn't fluid, who's just relying on being bigger than people, and I think a lot of it has to do with his name. A lot of it has to do with his name. So there's my Brendan Rice thing. Um, I know it's not going to be received well, but if you're going to do that, we've got Brendan Rice at home, and his name's Juwan Jennings. Uh, it's bottom line when it comes to that. Um, let's see. Uh, big city man says, how important are the guys that can separate on your list for the draft? Would you go first round? I would, um, Brian Thomas and, uh, good God. I just, I just said his name earlier, but Brian Thomas, uh, Brian Thomas Jr. Um, is somebody that I would definitely think about. Um, again, it's how the board lays because you can't go from 31 to 15. Like that's, that's just way too high to go up. But if you start sliding and he starts moving in a direction and again, the only way that you can go up and get somebody in the first round at a wide receiver position is if you've addressed the real needs for this team in free agency with guys that you know for a fact that are going to contribute. So I don't have a problem with it. I really don't. Because we're looking at we're looking at a team that when you get pressed and it's press man on the outside, aside from Brandon Ayuk, it's press man on the outside and you've got pass rushers, this offense could be stifled just a little. And there's only one guy that can separate, and that's Brandon Ayuk. Debo has a hard time. Jennings has a hard time. Hell, Kittle has a hard time. But you need those natural separators. That's why it's so hard for me to, like, look at this Brandon Ayuk thing. And obviously the cap has gone up, and he's not going anywhere, in my opinion. But it's hard for me to look at the idea of people saying, well, poo-pooing Brandon Ayuk being here, like, oh, it's okay. No. No, 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 no. Natural separators go above the scheme. Some guys can get schemed open. Some guys need to be schemed open. Some guys, it doesn't matter who's in front of them. They can separate. That's all that we matter. That's all that matters to me. That's the hardest part. So if you can get yourself open, regardless of the coverage in front of you, you know, press man, cool. That's exactly what you need. But the idea that this offense can be stifled a little when you run press man against them, aside from 11, being able to get open, 
that's the part where I'm starting to think, man, you guys need one more separator because then that really opens things up. It really opens things up, in my opinion. Um, Bishaw says, I know we met with Kool-Aid, but are there CBs we can get good value for in a draft? Kool-Aid could be a higher pick. Well, it sounds like, and I'm just going to keep saying Kool-Aid because his name is just awesome, and it's like the, the whole reason. But I'm going to say that there were a few things that I was hearing at the Combine about him that could have him slide. That could have him slide. Obviously, the broken foot doesn't help. The broken foot, he's not going to be able to work at the Combine. He'll be good for his pro day. It sounds like he's going to be 100% for training camp. But I think there was a little bit of character concerns and effort concerns in terms of, and I know that's not good to hear, but I'm just telling you, like, when the buzz is around a player like that, that's when you start to see him slide. And it's not an attitude thing. I think they were talking about effort on the field. Does he give max effort? Then the injury. It's not character concerns, right? It's not like this guy's going to blow things up or he's going to, to be a problem. But I think he can absolutely slide now. Um, and if he starts to slide, and I, again, I was looking at DJ's mock before I got on here, um, Daniel Jeremiah, they had him at 22 to the Eagles. And the Eagles have a clear need at corner, a clear need. But if you start to get into that range at 31 and you see a corner at 21, 22, especially with the Sorensen and Staley higher, I don't see why the 49ers wouldn't be inclined to go up a little bit more to get a cornerback. Um, again, the one thing this team really needs to improve, and I have no doubt in my mind that they're going to add more pass rushers or bring them back, and they'll find a way to get something out of them, is secondary. That's it. You keep the, the Amador Lenore, Lenore in the slot. You, you're running Hufanga and Tig, and you get yourself another corner that can cover. doesn't have to be as well as Mooney, but just as, as good. And um, this is a good one, too, as well, because uh, Vishal's asking um, good value in the draft. Um, Max Mountain. He's uh, from Rutgers five, six times, I believe, he's met with the 49ers. And he's a 49ers fan. Um, so that one's pretty good, too. Uh, I, I think right now what you're looking at is probably like 2-3. Um, but he didn't test. I don't think he tested very well. I have to look. I, I Obviously, I know what's going on right now. Um, and the combine is what it is. You know, it's just the uh, underwear Olympics. But, yeah, probably round 2-3, I would say. Uh, but, you know, the 49ers have met with him as well, too. That's why when you start to listen to – the corners and saying who they met with and they're just like oh the Niners the Niners and they're really going I think they're really doing their due diligence with that and when you look at the candidates that all have secondary background including Merritt uh from uh from I mean yeah Merritt from uh from KC they're all secondary guys so yeah I, I think you're seeing a shift in philosophy um, I, I know we joke that the 49ers are just gonna continue to draft D linemen. I have no doubt in my mind that they will at least one or two in this draft because they always do it depends on where um i think the only way that you really go with a, a edge rusher in the first round is if somehow chop falls um a little bit further or you can move into position to get him but i think after what he just put on uh on tape in the combine um he's for the streets like i think i think buffalo is going to be all over him now at this point because they need an edge rusher um i think it's it's hard to it's hard to like look at the defensive line and say even if they bring some of these guys back that you're excited you know i mean I don't think Chase Young's coming back. Uh, I don't think uh, – let me see who else. I think Kinlaw comes back. I think Kevin Gibbons comes back. I think Sebastian Joseph Day walks. Um, and then you've got to kind of just hope that Kalia Davis turns into what you think he is and Nick Bosa has a great season. So um, I think they'll find veteran guys. I don't think Randy Gregory – well, Randy Gregory might come back, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not, like, moved by that as much. I think they'll find veteran guys to to fill, um, whether it's off season, you know, free agency, or even you know a trade in the middle of the season. Um, I think they'll find a way to find production, especially if it, if Nick Bosa and Armstead and Hargrave play very well. Um, that that'll help a lot. But I do think that they're just they're going for corners. This is this is the this is their time now that they're kind of looking around and they just want to make sure go for uh, corners at this point. So, um, so yeah, uh. I feel like I've covered the the defensive coordinator and Staley. I think I think it's a great move. Um, I think it's I, I'm not worried about it too much. I, I think again in tandem game planning and play calling. I think I think it works. I think it's logical. Um, I think it's probably one of the only real logical ways to go about this in in terms of in terms of like how this late in the process when there aren't many candidates out there, 
I think uh, I think 100%, I think this is probably the best. And uh, here we go. I, I love a good disagreement. I agree with your overall philosophy, but disagree with Debo not being able to get separation. He's one of the better separating wide receivers coming out of the draft. Hamstring, shoulder, slowed mobility. I mean, right now, I mean, I'm, I'm just going off of what I saw in the Super Bowl. Like, the, the guy was having a tough time getting open. Um, and that, that wasn't even with Legereus need on him. Um, I think at times we – we overlook that because the 49ers don't really see that too much because so many people are worried about explosive plays. Uh, but I think we look at Debo as a football player, as a guy who just get him the ball and get out of his way. I think sometimes in his in his overall time, I would say the one thing that he consistently str- – not, not struggles with, but what, uh, the thing that pops up the most is probably the separation thing, in my opinion. But absolutely he was. Coming out of the draft, he was one of those guys. I don't know what it is. I don't think anything's really like zapped his his juice. Um, if if it's you know injuries, if if that's what what you're implying, I just think from what I've seen, he just has a tough time getting himself open. And I don't think we have those same concerns with Brandon Ayuk at all. Um, I think I think it's on tape all the time um, that he's open. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see. I think earlier in the year he looked like that guy again, um, especially like particularly into into like the the Philly game where he looked like, you know, the guy who had the team in his backpack. Um, but not only him, I think this team lost a lot of juice after the Philadelphia Eagles game. It felt like the team peaked that week. That that was the the week that they actually peaked. Um, and they had to try to figure it out, you know, and I think that kind of happened to Debo as well too, a little bit. Um, he had some games where he was good. He had some games where he just, you know, and then, you know, the injury obviously didn't help, but yeah, I mean, I, I just think that uh, he, he doesn't struggle with it, but he he can he can be better than that, I think, in my opinion, when it comes to those things. So, so I mean, if you guys want to know anything about uh, the combine, I'll tell you. Um, I spoke with a 49ers front office exec. Not going to give any names um, because it was off the record. But overall, I I was asking about the the coaching hires and the continuity and the family, and that, and the answer that he gave me was very surprising. You know, I said, like, you know, you look around, we're looking around in this place. I'm looking at, you know, this coach who's who's been hired somewhere else. This coach has been hired. Like, literally, these people were in the place that we were in. And he says, that's John Lynch, man. He's like, that's John Lynch. John Lynch is the guy that keeps it all together. And and that actually really surprised me. Because I think the overall perception of John is more like a media guy and someone who is good at handling the media, is a, is a face. He, you know, he's in broadcasting. But I was very surprised to find out that John Lynch is like the glue guy, kind of. And, you know, and all these guys are eventually, is eventually like, is eventually like going to keep this thing rolling. And they feel like they, they, they're going to keep it rolling. One more little interesting thing he said was, yes, we're family and they move on, but family always comes back. Which to me, and this is my tinfoil hat theory. You guys can call me crazy. You know, I love a good conspiracy theory. Is you know, there's a possibility that Ulbrick, Sala, those guys end up being back on the market next year. And not to say that Sorensen's gonna do a bad job or he's a lame duck or anything like that. But I think what he was implying was is like, you know, once a niner, always a niner, and we're always gonna give those guys looks. So it was kind of interesting to kind of pick his brain just a little bit on how they've been able to have guys move on and what really held it together, which was a little bit shocking to hear that. Oh, it wasn't shocking, but I he just he flat out was just like, hey, it's John Lynch, man. He goes, it's John. And and he's the reason that like this thing keeps rolling and that we have guys that, that continue to come back. I thought that was very interesting. Just a little nice little nugget that I got. Um, you know, while people are drinking alcohol in a place, uh <laughs> that that's the best time to get all that stuff. That's my favorite part of the 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 combine is uh the networking afterwards. Um but yeah, some other stuff that I was hearing is uh you know, apparently the, the Pittsburgh Steelers reached out to the Kansas City Chiefs um, for a trade. Uh, Legarius Need and George Pickens was involved. So, you know, it, it's clear the Kansas City Chiefs need themselves another n- number one wide receiver. Uh, Mike Evans is technically a free agent. But my God, that scares me to, to lose Legarius Sneed, but then have them added George Pickens. I, I don't like that for them as well, too. So, all right, let's see. Forbidden Enigma says, Jay, you're speaking facts. Ayuk was nowhere in the Super Bowl or Kittle. Whenever we go against elite teams, they all disappear. We need better receivers that can get separation. I think just another receiver. One more receiver that can get open on his own, 
um, and and not have to be schemed open, I think absolutely would unlock a little bit more in this offense. Could be in the draft. I don't know if it's in wide receiver. Um, a lot of the wide receivers that are there are either going to get tagged. The top three guys are what? It's Pittman, Higgins, and and Evans. Evans, I would still probably bet, goes back to Tampa Bay. Um, but Pittman's going to get tagged, so is Higgins. Um, but I I would love to see another receiver get himself open, you know, based on routes. Um, and I think that would would lift this offense just a little bit more, especially for Brock Purdy. You know what's the best part about all this is we're at the Combine. We're not talking about quarterback anymore at all. Um, John Lynch's presser was very, very relaxed, and it was for that reason. It was for that reason. No sorts of quarterback, uh, you know, questions, this, that, nothing like that. And thank you, Brock Purdy. Thank you. Kirk Cousins is a free agent. We don't care. We don't care. And that's so good, man. Uh, you know, you don't have to – John, no one asked about the quarterback at all, and I think that's what's really, really awesome about where this team is and why this draft is so important. You have Brock Purdy still under a contract, which he's not uh, one of the top 52 hits. And then you have 11 picks to kind of really put really put some pieces around while you have your guy, man. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Wolf says, do we keep Jennings? I'd love to draft Rice for the Jennings backup role. I see big similarities. That's what I was saying. Um, if you put the second round tender on Jennings, you're fine. But I do see similar receivers. But my problem is not that they're similar receivers. I think that's fine at the skill set. It's the hyping. It's the hyping of Brendan Rice as, wow, he's this, he's that. Oh, I. we got Brendan Rice at home. He's Juwan Jennings. Now, Juwan Jennings was in this draft. Would you be saying that about him? I see somebody, and I think Juwan Jennings isn't as, as stiff a route runner as, as Rice is. So it's. It's less about the skill set, which I do see the similarities, and more about the hyping of someone that has a skill set that's like Juwan Jennings. And if Juwan Jennings was in this draft, you wouldn't be saying that about him if his name wasn't Brendan Rice, if his, if his father wasn't Jerry Rice. That's it. That's all I'm thinking. You know, I, I'm okay with him being the potential replacement for Juwan Jennings if that's what you want to do. But taking that in the third round when you got Juwan Jennings in the sixth and you could just slap that second round tender on him, I would just take Jennings, man, at this point. You know, run it back with him one more year. Um, eventually, someone's going to try to sign him. But, uh, yeah, the third-round pick of Brendan Rice to be what Jawan Jennings is, it doesn't, it doesn't correlate for me. Um, I, I just don't, I don't see it. And, again, it's really, really because of his name at this point. Thank you for the donation as well, too, man. Like, I don't want to make this like I'm, I'm dumping on Brendan Rice. I'm trying to give you, like, what I'm seeing, right? Like, I, I see a guy who relies on physicality. I see a guy who isn't as fluid. Um, who can't gain separation, right? Jennings doesn't necessarily need to gain separation for his role, but the way that people are talking about Brendan Rice, it's a little bit hard for me to get on this hype train for him when I see so many similarities to a guy that's in the building already. And you wouldn't be saying that about Juwan Jennings. We'll see as it keeps going. But what I saw at the Senior Bowl, what I saw sometimes when I watched him play, was just a little bit of a guy that's just too stiff. It's just too stiff. Yeah, rice in his veins. Go up, go up, buddy. Um, 75 people in here, almost 45 minutes in. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell for when we go live. I wanted to talk about uh Frank Gore Jr. Um, and this is just purely on vibes. When we had a chance to interview him, his interview was spectacular. And I know that has nothing to do with football, but what I'm trying to get at is confident. Well spoken, knows his stuff, and he just comes across as a young man that nothing is going to be too big for him, at all. And obviously, they ask questions about, hey, your father, similarities. You know, Frank Gore said he's a better, he's a he's a smarter running back than I am. He'll probably go in the fifth, sixth round, maybe undrafted, maybe undrafted. But in the fifth, sixth round, I don't mind them taking a chance on Frank Gore, right? Um, I don't mind it. When you look at the value, what you're getting, you add him into the mix. We all know Elijah Mitchell has had trouble staying on the field. Jordan Mason, for whatever reason, can't get any sort of run <laughs> ever. Um, I guess they love him that much on special teams. But it wouldn't be the worst thing. And I think I asked Mike McDaniel at a press conference, you know, you have you have HN, you have Mostert, you know, HN 
has the highest yards per carry in the history of the game, albeit because he has so many so few carries. And most have scored all the touchdowns, 23. Do you feel comfortable with those guys going forward? And Mike McDaniel point blank said, there's no sort of moment where you're complacent and you're not adding, no matter what. And I thought that was a really good answer in terms of you've got guys, but you don't stop adding at positions because you're just like, oh, those guys are just going to be healthy and we're going to run with them. Like there has to be more, right? And I would rather wait a little bit longer on Frank Gore at the end than go in the third round, you know, and have yourself another CDP Trey Sermon situation. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is it. Uh, how are we going to not draft Rice, son? Uh, Rice out of all the games of his son's plays in the NFL. Which game you think he's going to? He's going to be at all of them. I mean, he's out of all of them now. I mean, there's not a camera that Jerry Rice Sr. hates. There's not a microphone that he hates. That man is absolutely 100% just uh, – just he just loves the camera he loves the attention man so yeah look um those names are really cool because of you know what it is honestly McCaffrey's the one that kind of sticks out to me the most as a wide receiver um if i had to pick on on the three like you had to have one probably be McCaffrey um uh, right now i'm our second that's how i feel um i gotta do a little bit more digging into frank gore but i walked away very impressed with frank gore's press conference like he knows the moment. He's not afraid of it. He was very, very articulate, um, confident. There was nothing, there was nothing about him that, like, you know, obviously scouting the player and the person is two different things, but the confidence that he exuded in that in that entire that entire press conference, it made me believe that he's a very mature young man. And I think that's part of the process. And I, I think that's what John Lynch was talking about, where we like to draft good players. Obviously, we have things that we look for attributes wise and the person. And that's why he talked about Jair Brown. So I, I think that's a little bit of it. And then when he said that he has he has a he had an informal meeting with the 49ers, well, that just means that he talked to his dad a little bit. That's that's essentially what that means to me. Um, the difference between formal and informal, um, probably not negligible, probably something really small. So for me, again, like if it has to be those three, I think I think you gotta go McCaffrey. His father's a receiver, Christian's a dog. Um but that's not the only reason. I do see some some good separation skills. I think he's going to be somebody that someone's going to be very happy with him in their offense, regardless if it's the 49ers or not. So, all right, guys, nice number of 69 people in here. Make sure you guys like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell for when we go live. Content's coming back. Uh, now it's just full on, straight up draft stuff. Just got back from the combine. Probably will take the rest of today and tomorrow. Oh man, I'm tired, man. It's been it's been a crazy week. If you guys are looking for offensive line news, make sure you're following Brad because today's their day. They're doing all the interviews. I already found out they they had a they had a meeting with Aurelius Mims from Georgia. That's great. Um, I think he's a guy who just has played a few games, but has all the skill set of being a monster. If you're looking for O line stuff, today's the day. If you're wondering why there were many days that no one was talking about O-line, O-line is today. That's why. So when you hear that the team is going for, you know, talking to D-linemen, talking to linebackers, all of those things is because the linemen were getting there today and they'll test tomorrow. So today, right now, I believe it's, it's uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's wide receivers, running backs. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for O-line news, please make sure you're following Brad. I know that man's out there hustling. I know that man is not sleeping. So. Uh, make sure you're tapping in with his content so he can buy himself some coffee because that man was running on not Dunkin', just black coffee. That's it. Like that's exactly what I've I've turned to. No, no sugar, no cream, black coffee, like a man. I feel like I just grew chest hair this entire week drinking black coffee. But I'm gonna get out of here, guys. Again, thank you guys for tuning in. Enjoy your weekend, enjoy the combine. Um, do your mock drafts. It's gonna be a lot of fun. But I do think that free agency is gonna tell us a little bit more what'll be prioritized in the draft especially if the 49ers are able to hit in free agency on starters, reliable starters and guys that have been successful in this league. So I'm going to get out of here. Um, make sure you guys tap in all week. Um, we'll be back sprint right option podcast on Monday. If I'm not mistaken, you know, you get Andrew's thoughts on everything as well too. I'm sure he's doing a lot of draft prep. Um, I believe he said trade it all for um, Fisk from Florida state. He's a seminal though. So don't listen to him too much, but I'm out of here. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Welcome everybody.
Let's go Niners. My name is Jason Aponte. Jason Aponte.